So welcome back, Megalithomaniacs. Thank you for uh, joining us once again. Uh, Gail is a landscape archaeologist, cultural heritage manager, and theorist whose area of archaeological research involves monuments, geographical and cultural landscapes, amongst other things. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks uh, for joining us. We really appreciate you coming. You know, uh, I know you're in Spain now, um, but you're from Australia. So you, you, you're moving around quite a bit. So luckily, we've got you where you're in a time zone where you can join us because we were concerned you were going to be coming in from Australia. So you'd be like <laughs> half asleep by now. So big warm welcome to Gail Higginbottom, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, as I uh, said just moments ago, and I'm very excited to be reunited with a few people um, whom I first met nearly 20 years ago um, down Avery Way. So let's begin. So today I want to talk to you about, or really, whoops, all about standing stones in Britain, but um, really solely those on the West Coast for well, that's where I've focused most of um, my work today. So this work that I'm going to show you stems out of two projects. One is called SHOW or Shared Worlds, which is um, funded by the European Commission. And the other is the Western Scotland Megalithic Landscapes Project, which really started with my master's thesis. And that was, has been funded by the University of Adelaide on and off through the years, and also DPP, Digital Preservation Projects. So generally, I have worked, I'm hoping you're going to see my cursor. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, but you can see the map of Scotland there. And on the west coast, which is your left-hand side, You'll um, see the general islands uh, of Lewis and Harris, but it's marked out on your right-hand side, zoomed in. So LH stands for Lewis Harris and so on. So the area on your right-hand side is where basically most of the work that I have done has been carried out. But if you go, zoom, um, move over to your left, you can see up there um, where I have marked out Stennis on the Orkney Isles done some work there and far left Callanish, but also um, done some preliminary works in Cumbria and now also in Wales, but with Wales, we're looking at dolmens. So before uh, we take a look at the discovery of these projects, let's take a look really a little bit of the background on megaliths in Scotland. The west of Scotland uh, is now interpreted by some as being as one of the earliest regions of megalithic culture in Britain, with the erections of tombs coming around 4000 BC. So here's Crayray. Um, so this really is really the beginning where stone is a building material and its associations with the dead uh, begin in Scotland. In the earlier Neolithic, right down to the late Neolithic, so let's, let's say all the way down to about 3000 BC, people are, or the entombed dead, are usually full inhumations or disarticulated skeletons. So basically people pull the bodies apart and put in some tombs, all the skulls might be together or the long bones might be together, or also the sexes may be split. So essentially, you're transforming these bodies. Sometimes these bodies were firstly transformed through excarnation rituals. And that form of uh, transformation is where you might leave the body out in nature or on a, um, a, a plinth of some kind, and you let the skin naturally slough off or be eaten off, and then you scrape the skin off later and rearrange the bones how you wish. So really um, a major feature of Neolithic mortuary ritual at megalithic tombs was that of deliberate circulation of the bones. So not only was the body transformed itself in the way it appeared, but also its original location of where it was first placed carefully as a dead individual. So together, these first major continental influxes of the use of stone and monumental tombs really define a significant part of the Neolithic in Britain. And through these, the West has, as I've suggested before, 
possibly became the very first region of megalithic culture in Britain. These constructions continued for more than 2,000 years. But 1,000 years after the first tombs came the first standing stone monuments, which included the great circles. And here we have Stenes. Stenes has 12, originally 12 standing stones in a circle, and it's mooted to be the uh, earliest henge in Scotland. So basically um, it was, it is again just as a hypothesis because they believe it was probably built with the henge surrounding it at the same time. We also have Callanish is the other great circle with 13 stones. I'm just talking about the circle now, not of its various other attachments. So significantly, this stone in the west on the Isle of Lewis uh, has a central monolith and they believe through excavation they have shown it to be true that the, the central monolith and the circle itself were built at the same time. And the period that it was erected was 3000 to 2900 BC, the approximate date of the erection of the standing stone of Stenes. And I say approximate because the actual erection of that standing stone circle has not been proven, only the henge itself, the date of the henge. Further, there are many, many more older dates associated with Kalanish for them to come up with that particular date, with the, stand, with the circle itself, that is. And the other interesting fact, actually, is that Kalanish is on the location of an older small henge, so Kalanish may well have been first. So with these very first freestanding stone monuments, the association of megaliths and the death and the dead, in fine, continued. They still involve partial or full skeletal material being deposited, but the material was usually the result now of cremation rather than things like excarnation. Nevertheless, we still have transformed dead as the focus associated with stones. For example, there was a burial calm which basically impinged itself on the northeast arc of the circle. This is completely different from the little megalithic tomb that was also later placed inside the circle. And Stenes has a central half, and in this half has been found charcoal and cremated bone. Over the 1,500 years after the appearance of these great circles, along with other standing stone monuments, the west of Scotland began to display a predominant use of much simpler and linear standing stone monuments. So let's take a look at some of these. Many of you will be familiar with them, but I think it's nice to show these beautiful stones. This is a slab. This is actually a stone pair. But notice the beautiful landscapes. And as I didn't put the name on here, this is at Port Ellen on Isla. So now we are in the Middle Bronze Age. Now the middle, in the Middle Bronze Age, the tradition of uh, cremating people continue and cremated body parts or full cremation burials are associated with standing stones. Now we have uh, two examples listed up there for you, <clears throat> please excuse me, with the dates. And what's really, I think, fascinating and intriguing with this is that the cremated bone is actually placed inside the stone socket before the stone is erected. And it may not even be a whole burial. So it's not actually about a funereal thing. It's not just about funerary. It's something else is going on here. And we'll, perhaps we can find out as we go through today. Then often they would add some lovely quartz crystals or other white stones before they erected the stone itself. Just showing you Glen Gorm here, because Glen Gorm was also excavated as we had a list up there, and it was found with a cremation burial. Now, I think it was Ardner Cross that they also discovered a little bronze bracelet nearby. All these monuments were able to 
I would say, alter the natural places very enduringly. They still stand today, and perhaps if it hadn't been for farming and high levels of population, we'd be seeing many, many more around us. They appeared on their own. They appeared with other standing stone monuments, and they also appeared with tombs, cairns, and also non-megalithic monuments. Now, the work that I do along with my colleagues in the West is really what we're trying to find out is where were monuments placed in relation to the landscape? Why were they placed there and not somewhere else? And in particular, we want to know what was special about that particular place they're in. Is it something to do with nature? What are the cues to be found there? So our work was really about the reconstruction of past visual experiences at the Standing Stones. Ultimately, our work on Standing Stones is about understanding context and to build towards a kind of a holistic experience through various approaches, including uh, extensive 3D visual contexts. So to do this, we used three main elements the monuments themselves, the landscapes, as already mentioned, and skyscapes. So, okay, right now I just want to flag the important notions that we all need to understand together when considering looking at skyscapes combined with landscapes before I actually move on um, to the results of the projects themselves. So let's have a look. For the, this will help people who are not familiar with archaeoastronomy or astronomy or wandering around the landscape and staring at things on the horizon. It will help you understand the work that we're going to look at now. Now, because for reasons unknown, the cursor has decided not to operate, I'm just going to guide you with my voice. So let's have a look at this particular image. And basically, each horizontal band is equivalent to looking at one half of the sky in the east. The right-hand side of the band is the south. So if you look like that to your right, it looks like I'm looking to my left on the screen, doesn't it? I'm pretending I'm looking to my right. That will be south. If you looked in the opposite direction, that would be towards the north. So the very top picture, we have a lovely little bright yellow point. That is the sun rising at the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. Then the next one down is the next month long. And notice that the sun now rises a little bit to the north. And moving on until the fourth horizontal bar, and now we're at the equinox facing east. And just travelling straight down to you get to where the point is the most furthest to your left on the screen, this is the sun at the summer solstice. And so it is now at its furthest point in the north. And if you will keep travelling down, you'll go down and then you'll get to near the bottom and the sun is now at the equinoctial point. And see now the sun is travelling towards the south. So that's so you can get a feel for when people say it's rising at its most extreme northern point or its most extreme southern point. You know what we're saying. We're talking about its position actually on the horizon as it's coming up. Okay. The west, of course, is... Um, you uh, a similar, you know, it's a similar operation. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out that's really important is that the sun at the solstices are not midwinter or midsummer, apart from the fact they're not even our midsummer or midwinter. The summer solstice is the first day of summer. Astronomically, it is the first day of summer. The winter solstice is the first day of winter. And if you're a farmer or something similar or an animal herder or someone who travels with animals and, and you're linked to seasons, this is what matters. Okay. Next. Here we are. That's us there, the little stick figure, standing in a mountainous landscape just like Scotland. And the thing I wanted to point out here is that, of course, the sun is always continuing on the same path yearly it has its various paths through the year but let's just pretend this is exactly the same time of year 
but we're looking at a different part of the horizon. And what you notice is the actual height of the horizon will change where on your, this part, horizontal looking area, changes where the sun will set before you. It might seem set more to the right or to the left, so more north or south, for, for instance. So this, the actual landscape itself will uh, instigate where the sun is seen by you to set or rise. So, of course, I'm talking about the human scale and what people see when they're standing at a monument. Okay, here's the next thing to know. Very fascinating, naked eye astronomy. <laughs> so you, most of you will already know that the closer to the horizon an object is from the sky, the larger the object appears. Now, the reason this is, though, is that because of something that's actually the way we are wired and and many other animals as well, we and atmospheric properties, we see when we step outside at night, not a circular dome over us, we envisage the sky as a long gated flattened dome. And this affects the way we see things. Our actual physical genetic makeup interacts with nature and causes us to see things in particular ways. And that's one of them. And this is just an example. Okay. Has any, um, I was going to ask a question, but of course you can't respond back to me. That would not work. Let's move on then. What I want to show you now is how um, we use all of that kind of knowledge to make our discoveries in Scotland. So what kinds of astronomy did we focus on? We focused on the movements of the rising and setting sun and moon at very well-known points that had already been tested um, statistically by other people such as Clive Ruggles and so on. So what we wanted to do, though, because Clive, uh, Clive's work focused very much on the idea that Argyll in particular and parts of Mull were candidates for these, through his statistical analysis, were candidates for these rising and setting points. But we wanted to look again and reassess these things going right across Western Scotland. So just so that you can understand, north is a central point, as you can see here, and south is both on the left and the right, and we did that for these pictures. These are actually 3D landscape panoramas created with the elevation data from the Ordnance Survey in the UK. And they are layered with the paths of the sun and the moon. So basically um, the red line that you can see there, both in the north and the south, they indicate the rising and the setting of the moon at the major standstill, which we talked about earlier today. And you can notice then the red line on the right-hand side towards the centre of the screen, that is the major moon's point, rising point as it comes out of the mountain and moves through the sky. If you look south, you can see that low effect, the moon low on the horizon as we discussed earlier today, in the south, scooting along there in the south. And that's its most extreme rising and setting points in the south. The central yellow lines are the sun at the equinox. The orange lines are solar. So what we discovered were, looking at those, aha, I've just discovered something here, sorry. It's just the way my screen's displaying and it's covering part of my, my slides because of the nice little pictures of everybody there. But we'll work that out. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you then, well, what are our astronomical discoveries? So let's firstly look at Argyle. You see the little map on the right-hand side of your screen? This is where Argyle is. So Argyle had an interest for orienting their monuments towards the sun at the winter solstice. They were also interested, so that's in the south, right? 
They were also interested in the rising and setting of the moon at the major standstill, both in the north and the south. Now, Mull only has statistical support, we're talking about only now, only has statistical support for orienting towards the major moon in the north and the south. There's no winter solstice orientations that we know of actually even at this stage. It's a long story. We're just <laughs> there. Uh, if we want to go into the details, we'll be finding some along the way. But Isla and Dura are very fascinating. They are in a world of their own. They don't even want to look at anything to do with like the major standstill or the solstices. That's just like we have no interest whatsoever. And they are interested in the area to the north and the south of the equinox, very rarely the equinox itself, just the north and south of it. And that's something I'm going to discuss with you tomorrow, another day. Northern Kintyre actually has an interest in the same astronomical phenomena as Argyle, as you might expect. I'm sure there were no borders like that there at that point. So they share an interest in those things. Now, uh, the um, North and Southern Urs, we actually do not know what they're interested in. They actually have the highest level of clustering towards the areas along the horizon, but we cannot we have not yet solved what the if is an astronomical input or not. We don't know that yet. So that was really the first, first thing we found out. But the other thing we found out, and I'm going to use now the, this landscape picture, is that there are basically two lots of horizons going on that, are, that people were interested in and we've produced statistical evidence for this. And some of this has got to do with the fact that they love valleys and they might be on one side of the valley or the other, but it also happens outside of valleys and not in major valley um, uh, geographical or geological features. So what's unique about this nice landscape we have here? The first thing you're going to notice is that in the north, the landscape or the height of the horizon, the topography is much higher in the north than the south. The south is lower. In the south, there's water. In the north, usually you have some kind of slope in the northeast and the northwest. And out of these high points, as we've already seen, come out the summer sun and the moon at its major standstill. And they set in the slopes of the same features. What we found in the south was that often you have either one or two sets of hills, one in the southwest, one in the southeast, that the phenomena will rise out of and then set into. A similar phenomenon can happen also in the north. You either get two or one mountain, but usually they try two mountain peaks, northeast, northwest, one mountain. So you have the slopes in the northeast and the northwest and occasionally like this. I mean, you can only choose so many sites when you've got like thousands of standing stones. Choose the best bit from Shui. Now, so here's some examples. So there's that nice mountain, slopes in the northeast and the northwest, water in the south, moon low over water in the south. And then there are places with lower horizons. Now, of course, these are really tiny on your screen. So if you're at Dunamuk, that feature in the northeast is actually really high. It's quite high. But we're trying to squeeze it into the screen. And Hof, um, Tyree, actually, they're hills, not mountains. So it is harder for me to use a tiny screen to project the information that I want to uh, convey. However, you'll see at Hof in the south, see the little mountain, sorry, little hills in the um, southeast and southwest and the moon coming in and out of them. So those are, those are the examples of the first style of landscape. Let's look at the second. Ta-da, guess what? It's basically the reverse. So in the north, look how flat that horizon is at Gruline and Mull really flat horizon in the north compared, compared to the south. It's a comparison thing. It's a relative thing. 
The other thing that uh, is very important at these sites that occasionally occurs is that the major lunar standstill cannot be observed. They use the hills in the south to block it. Mystery. We don't know why. The other thing that can happen sometimes is that the winter sun's appearance is blocked or partially blocked. As you can see in the south here at Ruline on the top, you can look left or right for this effect. So the winter solstice sun, you can see just a glimmer in one corner behind this hill. You can still have the rays in the sky, but you won't or hardly see the sun at all. But there are other landscape qualities too. And I uh, know other people have pointed these out in publications and we've had them out in publications. And one of the most fascinating sites is that you still get the same effect in tiny, in miniature. So here we are behind this lovely little stone. It has a very high hill, so to speak, in the north. But actually what it is, it's an amphitheatre. And so what we've discovered is that there are these little amphitheatres or large amphitheatres everywhere and we've got that long view going out. And here you have the same amphitheatre effect at uh, Kamasnagar. Around this stone you are surrounded by a cliffs, local cliffs, not this massive valley. It's not a mountain valley situation but you still get the same horizon shape as you do for the larger valleys, made in miniature in a sense. Now here we have again a, a stone that's on a little can. What happens is they're trying to choose a place to give it a higher profile in one direction than another, north or south usually, right? And it can only it can be as high as that. You think, well, that's not very high. Is that even useful? The point is it blocks things out from a distance and creates a position where the sun or moon can rise up close. Okay. So is, are these just all about coal, Tyree and Argyle? Can we find them anywhere else in Scotland? Are, we sh are these people sharing cultural knowledge about nature and topography of landscape and the importance of landscape elsewhere? So let's just have a look at what we've found so far. So here we are on sky. You can see the same landscape picked out. Look at that sun rising out. Look at the moon rising out of the peak. And the moon in the south, low as possible, with water in the south. You can see it's similar to the site at the bottom, which is like a larger valley system. The one in the south uh, is the site of Ullevold. Other sights on sky, really spectacular, even in a tiny picture. <laughs> and here we are in northern Argyle, water in the south. Sun and moon coming out of these slopes or on the tops of the plateaus in the northeast and northwest. I had a little dabble in northeast Scotland out of curiosity, but we haven't done any serious statistical work here, but you can you get the picture. And the valley systems don't run in necessarily the same direction, so it's not about the fact that they all also share the exact same geology. Here, guess guess where that is, everybody? <laughs> so here we are at Castle Rig. Spectacular. Down in Cumbria. And finally, we lose one of the mountains in the northeast, but you still have pretty much the same shape. Okay, so here we are. We've got monuments aligned to this, the sun here and the moon over there. And we've got landscapes with these amazing shapes, which in effect highlight these most, perhaps to them, significant points in astronomy, like the sun at the solstices, the moon at the extreme rising and setting, they are actually highlighted by very specific landscape forms. Why would you do that? What's, what's relevant about that? 
So let's really have a look at how do these landscapes and astronomical targets and movements of the sun and the moon work together at these sites. Basically, what I'm going to do is to reconstruct the experience and I'm going to read it out as a narrative in first person. And we're going to use the site of Gruline, which is that reverse site where the um, horizons are lower in the south. So by approaching the study in this manner, it's kind of anthropological and it will really help us I think fathom something of how the monuments and the presence of a landscape is experienced by people. But first, there are a couple of things you need to know about the moon and the sun. Now, the alignments on the moon, whether it's the major standstill or the minor standstill, were, we hypothesise, likely oriented on the moon's rising and setting when it was full because, of course, that's very spectacular. It looks, uh, you know, it's quite majestic. And as we saw in that photograph earlier, the closer it gets to the horizon, the very imposing it is. And if you've got close horizons that are high next to you in the south, very, very, very dramatic. So our reasons are um, for this looking at the uh, full moon is that, as I said, it's majestic visually. And also, we do have a number of sites, as many of you will know already, where the moon travels along the horizon and tends to like fit that horizon shape as it goes along. And as well, if it just drops behind a hill for a bit, it glimmers through the notches. So it's very striking. And these events are going to be far more noticeable and visually striking when the moon is full. It's also much easier to align a nice, large, circular body. Secondly, uh, you need to know, and we, did, we heard this earlier in the discussion, that the moon can only be observed as full when the sun is on the opposite side of the sky. Thus, a full setting moon in the south can only occur, uh, really occur uh, at the summer solstice. Okay? So if we're looking for the full moon at, at its extreme rising and setting points, it has to be the summer solstice and the sun rising and the other side of the sky. So our example then is going to be uh, Gru Line. And we have one nice little rectangular, slightly leaning stone on one side and closer to the hills in the south, uh, this beautiful, as I call it, a fabulous axe shaped stone, nicely aligned there, looking very beautiful. So where is it on the map? Can you see Gruline basically in the centre there? Now, what I want to point out to you is look at the mountains in the south, also towards the east. So Gruline is positioned in the landscape where the most dominant mountains, and they are mountains, are south, right, to create that blocking effect I was talking about before and a little bit in the east-northeast, but, I mean, east, east, a little bit north. So we can actually see it in the topography surrounding the site. Yet yeah, other sites on Mull, exactly the same island, do not have that set up, okay? Just up close, visual proof. Okay, so here we have the landscapes of Gruline. Okay, the top one and the third one are the same. I've just increase the y-axis so you can see what's going on a little bit better. Now, one view is from one stone and one view is from the other. Now, visually, the topography is exactly the same, you know, almost exactly the same, I should say. But what's noticeably different, and you have to kind of uh, look really closely because you've got a small screen, is that stone A, which is the rectangular stone, when you're looking very closely at the mountains, you will see that uh, the winter sun glimmers a little bit in the notch, both for stone A and stone B. Can you see the sun glimmering in the left-hand side notch? But as you move right, notice the winter sun does not appear again for stone B, but it does for stone A. Also, the moon, which is the green line on the right-hand side in the south, 
you can see that with the green line, it just curves right, the moon just rolls along over the top of that mountain. But for stone B, which is the axe stone, you can see that the moon taps the first notch and then drops behind the notches on the right. So the way the sun and moon uh, are seen are different, even though they're only a few hundred metres apart. And this is going to play a part in the, in the little narrative that I'm going to read out for you. And you're probably wondering what on earth are those red lines that are going up and down there. So basically from the stone A, you can see the rising, your, the indicated rising of the moon at the minor standstill. From stone B, you can see the setting of the sun at the summer solstice. Okay. So what we're going to now, what I'm now going to read to you, is a nice little story about the events that happen at the summer solstice in real time. I may be running out of time. Oh, we're going okay. So here we are. Close your eyes if you like. It is summer. When I stand on the greatest or smallest aisles, I can see that the differences between the suns and the moon's rising and setting positions along the horizon are getting less and less each day. I know that the great event of the summer sun approaches summer solstice. The soft light is now continuous throughout the night and after the sun drops behind the horizon, it is still light. It's still light enough to carry out ordinary activities outside our family's dwelling for some hours. At this time, some of us travel to our designated place on our clan's Western Isle. At this place, we divide. Some stand with the eternal witness stone closest to the sea and the others with a mountain witness stone. The rest of us stand around. Each night over a few days, we stand again at our assigned places watching the sun in the north. On the marked day, all of us can see the sun rising in the northeast and with this morning twilight passes. Those that are standing with the witness of the sea, 16b, can see the sun rise out of the dominant northern mountain chain and run along its edges for a short while. As time goes by, every one of us has to rotate our entire bodies to watch the daily progress of the sun. A ritual. Firstly, towards the east as it moves south and then southwest as it traverses the sky and across the water and the peaks. We later turn to face the west and northwards again to watch the sun set into dominant range in the northwest. However, it is only those of us standing with the sea witness that are clearly directed towards the exact and appropriate setting position of the summer solstice sun with the alignment of the stones. In readiness, we stand together and look along the line that runs between the witnesses of the sea and the mountain and out towards the precise hilltop upon which the sun will set behind the sea. We who see this call out together as the sun touches the earth. We are the people of the sea and the sun. We look out west in anticipation of the next imperative encounter. Those standing with the witness of the mountain look along the direction from the witness of the mountain towards that of the sea and beyond. They are guided by the witnesses to watch the most distant mountains in the west, hoping for the full moonrise. Should be saying east. <laughs> Almost immediately, we all look upon the face of the peering moon, which is light, bright and large, almost upon us, rolling along the nearby southern horizon. Initially, the twilight is broken on the horizon and across the landscape in the direction opposite. We are surrounded by light through the amphitheater directly under the hill in the south that contains the darkness. We do not have to move as we follow the progression of the moon from rising to setting. We move just our heads. However, it is only those with the stone of the mountain that can watch the lunar disk as it travels in its entirety over the entire dominant range without touching the earth. 
Here the disc never falls. They can witness the moon's unbroken trail through its lowest and most southern path in the sky. We are all aware that the setting of this summer sun comes to the return for coldness and darkness and the next cycle of life. But the night is now alive with light and the moon is witnessed to touch the earth for the last time this night on the highest mountaintop. In the morning, we look together for the turning of the sun. It is now for us, the people of the sea and the sun, to attest the sun's actions. We watch and wait. Looking along the line made by the witness stones towards the horizon. Here the sun creeps into the world. We can see that the sun has made its way slightly further south around the horizon and a little higher up the slope towards its winter home. It has begun the journey to the time of endings and possible eternal darkness, that of the nights around the start of winter, the solstice. So this was a kind of interpretation about how we uh, can visualise a narrative of the past through astronomically, statistically confirmed evidence. So we have this narrative, we've had the possible rituals, get a sense of what's going on in the landscape, how the sun and moon play around the horizons, how they're seen and aligned to the stone by the stones. But what is the significance of this? What is important about this? This is one of the ways I like to interpret this place. I feel that very specifically, these visual experiences that I've described in, in a sense first person show us the coming together of the various liminal, you know, like between heaven and earth, sea and earth or sky, dead and the living. These liminal properties really express transformations of time. So they, I'll say it again in a different way, coming together of these various liminal properties and transformations of time are now expressed as events. You are becoming morning and evening. There is the beginning of twilight and the taking away of twilight, the coming of summer and winter solstice, the designating of alternation of winter, warmer and colder seasons, the extreme setting positions of the moon and the sun. These are all experiences of types of transformations at the most fundamental level where events are equated with and designated by topographical positions, you know, on the horizons. It is along and upon these horizons that the transformations of the sun and moon are witnessed. Really, here is their clearest sign of their appearance and disappearances, the biggest differences between light and dark, changes in quality of light. It's also at the horizons where the moment of the rising and setting of the solstice or special lunar events, these liminal events, where the sun will turn back, where the moon turns back. Therefore, the horizon of the earth is a very significant place. We have prominent peaks. From this, we can really possibly envisage that the sun and moon themselves were witnessed as liminal creatures or entities. They have their own forces of light and darkness. And I'm going to skip through pages of information now quite quickly. But the moon, you know, is very much a transforming body through all of its cycles, half moon, dark moon. And they're relentless. They go on. Yet the moon, so tiny and sometimes so huge, can obliterate the sun. So what are we, what's going on here? For me, a lot of these things are really about the cosmological oppositions. Okay, we have this light and darkness, morning and evening, high and low, cold and warm. And to me, when I say cosmology, what I mean is the understanding of the universe, their understanding of the universe seems to be illustrated by oppositions. And they've set up all of these oppositions by the simply seeming standing stones. Okay. 
What about understanding? That's in a nutshell, and I'm just going to read it out. It is theoretically relevant to uphold that monuments are not byproducts of more important processes. They are actually important within themselves. They participate in this. They are the witnesses, right? They are part of society. And by, and which I haven't written down here, but something that's in one of my papers, my idea is really that when you cremate these people and you put them into the standing stone and the stone witnesses all of these events and there's this coming together of this magical place, the stones are now alive. They are now members of society and they hold a place in the cosmological vision of people of the past. But is that all? I think that's quite a lot already. But you know what? The standing stones really observe so much more. They are cosmological witnesses, but not just of the amazing comings and goings of summer and winter and oppositions. They see everything, right? What is it they see? So we've now just discovered other things through the use of Stellarium, which other people have talked about before. And I'll quickly go through these because of time. Here's a quick view of Stellarium uh, on the top with uh, an elevation model, topographical model of the site of Loch Bui, the stone circle on Mull, sweetest little stone circle. So what am I pointing out here? Here we are at the summer solstice of uh, approximately, there we are, 1500 uh, BC. And why am I highlighting this? I'm pointing this out to you right now because here we are. The sun hasn't risen yet. It's just about to. And what do you really notice? Notice that the mountain in the northeast is shimmering, it has a lovely halo just before the sun arises. Well, guess what? Just after the sun sets, the very significant mountain in the northwest has a halo. So very specific topographical features are highlighted by the light of the sun. And when you're standing in semi-darkness, if we could actually be there, if I could project this on the screen, in fact, I should have told you, turn out your lights, everyone, or pull, pull your curtains over because we're about to see some slides in the dark, so to speak, and you won't be able to see this highlight unless your room is more dark. But essentially you can be surrounded by this twilight, but one mountain stands out, the mountain behind which the summer sun has just set. Or oh, is about to rise. So here we go. The first three are the same site, and I just wanted to point out how you can see here that the glimmer and the glow on the northeast or the northwest, depending on the time of day. Now the fourth slide down. Uh, this place only has very small hills, and I'm afraid because it's so tiny, it's harder for you to see. But basically, we have the sun setting at the summer solstice in the northwest and the small hill is a glow, special hill behind which the sun is setting. The same thing happens on the uh, second to last slide. That's Ullevold. And there is another, uh, and there's Ullevold at the sunrise at the very bottom. So basically you have your landscapes chosen to accentuate these very particular for uh, astronomical events. Landscape and astronomy are tightly linked. Okay, so here we are, again, summer solstice at midnight. Now what I'm going to do is now point out things that can be seen at every single site in Western Scotland at 1500 BC, the approximate time these sites were erected. And they can be seen from hundreds of years around this point. First thing, it's midnight. Look in the north. Can you see that nice orange glow? To our 
well, not even two hours, a certain amount of time before this and after, you don't see the sunlight at all. And then suddenly at midnight, ta-da, you have this lovely curving sunlight centering on north because midnight is defined by the sun being in the north. If your horizon was too high, you wanted a nice high horizon in the north, super high, you won't see that. But you will see it either where you've got nice peaks that drop in like this, so northeast, northwest, and your peaks are down. You'll see the sun filling like this at midnight. The other thing that's fabulous at midnight um, that, if, that they all see, and it's very fascinating astronomical phenomena, right, is that can you see that nice little arrow? Well, that arrow is pointing towards a particular star in the astro asterism of Ursa Major. Now, I'm not saying Ursa Major as a constellation was important because you could join a million dots at that time, but asterisms stand out because people can see them very easily in the sky. And this little asterism is shaped like a hook, horizontal hook at the moment. Everywhere at midnight, the second star in this asterism, Ursa Major, is directly above north. I think it's a very nice little picture and can form part of the story of their cosmological story. And I'm pointing this out because something amazing happens at the winter solstice. Let's travel through. Uh, yep, different side. Can you see the north litter up? And can you see if you look straight up above north, the second star in the asterism, dead north. It's a lovely sight, but what's interesting is how it's framed in the hills. It's framed in the hills. The other fascinating and fabulous thing about this, I may have time later, is that, of course, the circumpolar stars turn in a circle between and around these hilltops. Okay, yep. Ah, different sight. Again, the lovely asterism straight above north is shining in the north. That was at Potty on Mull. So here we are at Ardna Cross. It's much darker. And we are now at nine o'clock at night. And the thing I'm trying to point out here actually is about how you can actually process the concept of time by watching the sky at night looking for very particular astronomical features at nine o'clock at Ardna Cross, before, clearly before midnight, we have Ursa. This is now uh, the winter solstice, by the way. Now the winter solstice. Nine o'clock at the winter solstice, if you're standing in the stone road at Ardna Cross, you have the uh, linking asterisms of Ursa Major. If you look straight above the stone, which you can only see if you're in a dark room, a nice hook like so is standing straight up above the stone. And I just want to point towards, can you see the Ursids? They're not actually seen at this time uh, of uh, 1500 BC, but below it there's three little stars, uh, sorry, two little stars. This is actually the little stars, the beginning of the hook of Ursa Minor. And I'm pointing that out because it becomes significant. So oh, I've, made this, I've made this slide brighter, I forgot. So you can see the asterism standing up as a hook, like a shepherd's crook above the standing stone. So here we are now, midnight at the winter solstice. And what have we got? We have Ursa Minor, only, only the asterism, I'm not saying that Ursa Minor is relevant, but the asterisms, which are very bright, again, a nice little shepherd's crook. And the second star in the crook is above north. Now, all are, the only thing I'm trying to point out are these shared visions of the astronomical world of the past can be seen and therefore known, and they're shared across this area. So it's just to show the kinds of visions people were seeing, but it's significant about timing. You can time things through the night according to where things appear just as people do today when they're in you know, maritime and probably in prehistory. This is the last slide I wanted to show in relation to landscapes. 
back to guru line <laughs> we've already had all that wonderful things about alignments but it's not just about alignments it's about what i've been trying to emphasize is the entire sky the whole skyscape and landscape working together and here we are at the winter solstice what is going on south can you see those tiny little dots there and we have jupiter and venus very close to the horizon at about 4 30 in the late afternoon but as you travel through the night you go down to the next little slide they start to set but as they set two more uh, actually one's a planet sorry both planets um then we have stars coming up. So we've dropped two planets and just west of, sorry, just east of south, you have two more stars coming up, two stars coming up. What actually goes on through the evening is just this row, a line of planets and stars coming up just before the southern horizon, gliding over the horizon and dropping down again through the night and with that you can actually time the night you go through timing the night when you're standing this is from the view of standing at the standing stones it grew on so in a sense what i'm trying to do is to reconstruct events i've got some videos we, i can show you later so you can actually see what i'm talking about and if you had a massive screen on the wall, you'd be like, whoa, watching this. It's, it's really incredible. So what we're doing is reconstructing the experience somewhat of what has been going on here in real time and then also really, in a sense, a little bit about the other things that people can see. So I think that standing stones, how simple they look and how complex they are, they are viewing a very complex world. They're talking about pure existence, how things work. I think they talk about a sense of infinity they, or how they wish infinity, things will continue forever to encourage the cycles perhaps, a sense of eternity, maybe the necessity of the universe, the sense of the importance of an all-encompassing existence. Is there a sense of the divinity of the cosmos? You know, they... But if nothing else, it's bigger than us. It's more than us, but we are part of it. it. This view gives us a sense of the place in the universe at large. How do we fit in? What's going on around us? How can we understand it? Or this is how we understand it. This is what we know. This is what we believe. So in a sense, perhaps... Standing stones are places of transcendence, making the inexplicable understandable, or at least it represents an understanding. To think of yourself as part of a vast interconnected scheme, I think gives one a sense of being at home actually in the universe. We're not afraid of this big thing, we're part of it. So I think that through the construction of stone, water and land, the cremated dead, beautiful magical white stones and specific ast astronomical phenomena, these builders of monuments have produced dramatic bounded visual events in time. These are played out using a spectacular show based on light and darkness and manipulating these through the position in sense of the stones and cells and the sun and the moon and every body, astronomical body on the landscape itself demonstrate the significance of the sun and its connection to life and its lack of course to death. Thus, for the creators of the Standing Stone Monuments of Western Scotland, these sites embody the fundamental knowledge of being or existence and the opposite of these, places that pronounce the world begins here, the world ends here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Most appreciated. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, and we can uh, also look forward to um, Gail's lecture tomorrow morning, the first lecture of the day, 11, where she's going to be looking at the um, area of northwest Spain. So we've got a few questions, Gail. Um, so we've got um, Gwyn and Gwyn and Alison. Hi there, guys. How are you doing? Um, so. We've got a question. Has anyone checked to see about seasonal fishing or bird hatching in these areas? 
that would be marked by those dates. And it's, they're talking about mackerel shoals or puffin nesting. Thank you from Alison. Does, does, can you answer that? Uh, sure. I would say I haven't, uh, I, but I'm, the people that tend to study uh, wild animal behaviour tend to be the people studying the Mesolithic, which actually, when I was going to say it's a mistake, what I mean is the people who study Neolithic and Bronze Age, we should also be studying animal behaviour because people are connected to wild animals for a very long time and, like you say, fishing on the coast and so on. I've just started something in Iberia looking at seasons and uh, what's going on in nature. And I think that's an excellent question and I would like to find out more because, you know, maritime uh, and or terrestrial seasonal activities are, are just tightly linked with astronomical knowledge. Absolutely, because like this coming of the solstice, it's not just about where is the sun on the horizon. You can look at a particular constellation when it appears you know the solstice is coming in two weeks or it's also linked to, like, say, certain fish coming or birds coming or nesting times. And I would really like to see about that. In Australia, by the way, there is one example and that is the emu so we have an emu constellation, I'll just put inverted commas, because actually usually it's a blackout. You might know that Indigenous astronomy is about black, often about black spaces. And there's rock art with the emu on there, which has the same shape as the, as the actual emu cutouts in the sky. And this occurs at the time, apparently, of uh, emu nesting, like the constellation appears at this time. So they're wow. linking these things together in their cosmological understanding. So someone has started somewhere else. Fantastic. That's very, very interesting. Uh, we've got a question from Matthew Smith. He says, great talk. Have you come across um, evidence of woodland forests being managed in ancient times to benefit these sites or viewpoints or any other earthworks to enhance these particular viewpoints? I love that question. <laughs> you no, know, I don't know the full answer yet. You know, paleo-environmental work in relation to monuments as opposed to settlements has really only been kicking off in the last decade and really only in the last few years. And so specifically targeted paleo-environmental evidence is few and far between. But it's really important. But what's interesting is that a lot of the places uh, that are nominated for sites, we know that it's likely that they have open oak-dominated forests. They're quite open, so that means that you can still see the close horizons, for instance. And also for six months of the year, they have no or some leaves because they're deciduous. So it helps you in that way. But there are some tombs, for example, that they do know have those areas have been claim, cleared first. Uh, but when it comes to standing stones, I don't, um, apart from Kalanish, where they knew if the area was ploughed in that, that space first, that's the only one I know of very specifically. And this is something actually that we have put in um, some money money for, in fact, for a, for a grant. You're uh, on the nose with what we want to know about that. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry, is that well enough answered? That's great. That's, that's perfect. So, <laughs> so we've got a couple of short questions here. Um, um, I'm not sure exactly. This is from Stephen. Are they working with magnetic energies invoked by different celestial positions and also earth positions as above, as below their guides? Now, I'm not sure exactly uh, if you... I have got a sense of what that question means, but I certainly haven't, and I don't know of anybody who works in archaeology that has been doing that kind of thing. I know there are people who have interests in related topics, but then they don't tend to look closely at the astronomy. They just tend to look at the, the position of monuments on the ground and their relationship to each other. And, again, this is non, uh, generally non-archaeologists. I've not known anybody to pull that together. 
Oh, and by the way, for the previous question, Matthew Smith says, thank you, Gail. Great answer. Smiley face. So uh, there you go. And uh, so <laughs> and we've got another one. We've got two more here. There might be a couple more jump in as well. Uh, so this is from Francisco. Um, during the sunset and due to refraction, the yeah. sun could be seen even when it is behind the earth from the observer's point of view. During the winter solstice, the sun's trajectory is flatter than during sunset. Okay, because of the flatter trajectory and also due to light refraction, the sun will be seen longer, even if it is behind the earth. Okay, does this mean that the sunset duration seems longer during winter solstice than during summer solstice? Did you get all that? Get all that. I mean, I did get the words. Um, first point I'll just make out is that the models that we use use uh, or can, uh, sorry take into account uh, things like refraction, atmospheric condition, generally, you know, according to latitude and so on. So anything that's reproduced for us to understand how it's working when you're standing at the standing stones is fairly well incorporated. Um, have we actually, can you, I'm going to be a pain, just read that out again so I can answer that properly. Okay, uh, yes. <laughs> It's, it, you can actually read it as well. It's in the Q&A box uh, if you want yes. to check it out yourself. You might want to kind of do that because uh, yeah. so basically, it, you know, what he's asking is the sunset duration seems longer during the winter solstice than during the summer solstice because of uh, the sun's trajectory uh, at different times. But, yeah, um, that's quite, quite a good question, that. I'm just going to stop sharing so I can check the um, okay. Q&A. Sorry. No worries. Uh, my Q and A miles behind. Hold on, let's zip down there. And um, that was Stephen, was it? That's Francisco. Oh, Francisco, where are you, Francisco? Oh, does you? No, that's Gobekli Tepe. Are you sure it's in Q and A and not in um... Q and A? Not in chat. chat. Yeah, it's in chat, right? Not in chat. No, no, no. I can read it again. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> during the sunset and due to refraction, the sun can be seen even when it is behind the Earth from the observer point of view. During the winter solstice, the sun's trajectory is flatter than during sunset. Because of the flatter trajectory and also due to light refraction, the sun will be seen longer, even if it is behind the earth. Does this mean that the sunset duration seems longer during the winter solstice than during the summer solstice? I would say that's going to... Most of these um, calculations that you're discussing are usually assumed... Uh, so. The underlying is assumption is that the horizon is flat, like zero. It's not moving. So they have all these underlying assumptions for astronomical assessments. And then we have to bring in the point of altitude. So I'm going to say that it's going to entirely depend on the height of the horizon in the situation, in the position that you are at that time, and it may not be noticed. So it's something that maybe uh, if you have a very dead horizon, if that timing, you know, is the timing difference even real? Like it's a reality, but would a human pe person be able to observe it? And that's going to be entirely dependent upon a horizon. But I'm going to go and ask some astronomy friends about that, okay. uh, about, the, about the possibility of what is the time difference that someone could observe that? Because I think that's really interesting. Thank you for that question. Okay. Um, and we've got Juliet G. She's asking this. Have you done some studies on the distances between those megaliths and sites? Or have you mainly based your conclusion on the landscape, equinoxes, stars, etc.? And she goes on to say, I think Howard Crowhurst has done a similar job, but he's also done some studies on the distances. Just, just say it again. What's the, what's the question about the distances? Sorry. I've Have you done some studies on the distances between the megaliths, or is it based on the landscape, equinoxes, and stars only? Uh, okay, you mean between the megaliths and each other megaliths, some megaliths yeah. and other megaliths, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just, be, just because we're talking about distances, one thing I didn't say uh, in regards to distances is that we also looked at the distances of the site to the horizon. And so those sites with the high horizons in the north and, and sorry, uh, yeah, altitude I'm talking about, not elevation, higher altitudes in the north and the south, those ones with the apparent higher horizons are actually close. They could be anywhere between 50 metres or two kilometres, but they're always closer than the southern horizon and vice versa. 
When it comes to the distances between monuments, I haven't done a measurement, but I have uh, considered, for instance, the alignment that monuments take through the landscape, you know, that, and that could be over 30 kilometres or something. When I say alignments, the sense that they have a certain connection, whether they can be seen or not, uh, and also relationships with other monuments in the area in relation to astronomy. I have done that, but not specifically the way that you're asking. And I'm very interested in, uh, I'll have a look at the other person's work to see if, how our work relates to it or not. Thank okay. you. I always like extra uh, direction and references. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. I've got one more here from uh, Ivy Marriott. Um, have you found a date when all the circumpolar stars fit between the two hills, meaning that no circumpolar stars set behind the hills but all can circle within the gap? I haven't yet, but basically um, over a thousand years, uh, these stars are still rising and setting through here. So what's interesting is that when the horizons are high enough, um, we actually have what we would call a circumpolar star. They are actually rising and setting through here. So they rise here and then they set in, the, again, these really two significant hills in the landscape, like uh, Capella is usually thought of as circumpolar and the others will circle around up here so some of them are coming in and out of these two whilst the rest rotate here but I have not seen yet anything uh, a period of time because I haven't thrown the numbers in but I can do that and that would be very interesting but you know what if it's too far back in time, then the standing stones weren't there. But that doesn't mean the place itself wasn't already important. And my hypothesis is that these places were already significant before the stones were put there. Interesting, interesting. So it was like a sacred landscape before even megaliths were placed there. It was kind of like yes. a liminal space that maybe people felt they should do things here, you know, because I it had a... Crathers, I think Crathers, which I worked on as... Um, uh, when the project was running in archaeoastronomy and I as as the uh, archaeoastronomer lead I guess would be the right with Andrew Smith equivalently Andrew Smith is the person who wrote the software for this recreation these 3D landscapes Andrew Smith of Adelaide University just plugging that in there um yeah so uh, they were and uh, Crathers had that fantastic uh it had that fantastic pit alignment, which was recut again in the Neolithic and reused, which I actually think is aligned to certain astronomical phenomena, which you can read in our report with the uh, Scottish authorities, uh, but slightly different to the uh, other interpretation that's come out. But I think that this site was ongoing of interest for thousands of years, and I think it's the same for many standing stone sites. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Gail. Well, I think we've uh, we've gone through all the questions. Oh, no, we've got one more. One more. One more has just come up. Um, so this is Francisco again. My former question regarding sunset serration, duration, I guess, tries to explain historical episodes like the one which Joshua orders the sun to stop in order to finish a battle. Uh, in Spain, the Tentudia Monastery name comes from a general that said the sun... Uh, detend to dia stops the day in order to have time to finish a battle against pagans so i don't know what is exactly what's being asked there but i get a sense it's um yeah it doesn't appear my questions seem to come later in my window you seem to be an advantage okay <laughs> <laughs> no so basically saying when historical events are connected to particular astronomical phenomena uh, is there anything yet that we've found that might be connected to such things is that that's the kind of thing. Yeah, and he was talking yeah. about the one which Joshua orders the sun to stop to finish a battle, and then there's the Tentudia Monastery, which came comes from a general who said stop the day in order to have him time to finish a battle against pagans. All well, right, yes, I I personally don't um, know an, um, enough historical associations in that in that sense with uh, known 
events, um, we would have to ask another person who studies the his later history of astronomy. I've studied some ancient, uh, like ancient Greek astronomy, but not nothing later. So in, uh, and even then, I can't think of anything in particular related to uh, early Greek history in relation to that. Having said that, there's a, you know, and this may sound like a bit of a woo-woo thing. However, but we do know about a lot of major events going on in the Mediterranean around the Middle uh, Bronze Age, uh, what we call the Middle Bronze Age, sorry, in the UK, uh, where there are a lot of uh, dramatic um, natural events going on at the time in relation to like volcanic activity and other things. And that, of course, affected the way the sky could be seen, like blackouts for some mm. and things like that. And we know that there were lots of um, major historical events that happened through that time with civilizations changing and so on. So the effect it had on them, it's just a related point. I'm just throwing that in there. Okay, that's cool. No, okay, I, th I think we're good. So I think that's all the questions. Thank you, Gail. We really appreciate your time. <laughs>